So welcome everyone to the final in our Works That Shape the World lecture series for 2021. Let's begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting today and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present. Our speaker today is Professor Simone Dennis from ANU School of Archaeology and Anthropology. Simone is the author of a number of books, including Christmas Island, an anthropological study, as well as uh, For the Love of Lab Rats, Kinship, Humanimal Relations and Good Scientific Research, and most recently Smoke Free, A Social, Moral and Political Atmosphere. So today Simone's going to speak to us about the enduring importance of the 1966 anthropological classic Purity and Danger, an analysis of concepts of pollution and taboo by Mary Douglas. And um, what we're going to be doing afterwards is uh, inviting you to use the, the chat function or the Q&A function to ask Simone any, uh, any questions that, uh, that you have. So we should have plenty of time for a, a good discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, that makes me sound like I'm a jack of all trades and indeed I am. And that extends to the fact that I am by no stretch of the imagination, a dedicated Douglas scholar. So um, please don't, <laughs> please don't have that in your heads as, uh, as what we're going to be talking about today. And in fact, on first pass, I'm probably more of your casual user of Douglas, the kind that the editor of Health Risk and Society Journal, Patrick Brown, would describe as typical. In his role of editor, he notices that almost every author submitting to that journal makes an obligatory nod to Mary Douglas's work. Um, and that's because their insights are relevant to just about every bit of copy that he receives at that journal. And that in itself, I think, says a fair bit about her influence. Oh, sorry, can you just plug in my battery? Um, but Mary Douglas is special to me, um, for better or for worse, because she's indirectly responsible for my reputation among anthropology students at this institution. More on that later. Suffice it to say for now that even though my scholarly expertise is typical, that is to say general, in the sense that Patrick Brown intends it, my relationship to her is also and almost and, and equally as special and not at all typical. As we'll see, that remark I've just made is not just a straightforward claim about her value to me, it's really a claim about her world-changing status, and in, partic in particular, the world-changing status of the work that I'm talking about today, Purity and Danger from 1966. Now, that's certainly her best-known work, and indubitably one of the most important anthropological works of the 20th century. In the world-changing department, it's had a very significant impact outside of the discipline of anthropology, yielding insights into everything from architecture to consumer behaviour, from humour to hunger, from urban design to the Holocaust. In all of those arenas, its particular worth has been founded in revealing taxonomic thinking and its importance to world making. And the work contributes to, to the dismantling of Western and non-Western difference, often presented as European pretty by Mary Douglas's writing. Where Malinowski eroded that particular difference in and through the establishment of universal rationality, Douglas erodes it by recourse to the notion that modern Western conceptions of dirt and responses to it, not this one, through naturalized though naturalised and presented as rational, paralleled the superstitious practices attached to primitive religious rituals. And at the time, in 1966 and beyond, that was a really uncomfortable and very unsettling idea. Purity and Danger is indeed an influential work, but it wasn't always one. Well into the late 1970s, the exploration of social and cultural systems and their exclusions, prohibitions and margins was somewhat ironically initially considered pretty marginal to anthropology itself, something that reportedly caused Mary Douglas very significant discontent. I want to touch really lightly later on the conditions of its production and those to be and, and take not to be insignificant in how and why the work wound up having the clout that it eventually did have well beyond the disciplinary bounds. 
So let me offer a bit of a roadmap through what I'm going to say today and that way you can decide if you want to stay. I'll start us off by way of a really brief orientation to what purity and danger is about. And then I want to focus on just a couple of things that I think are particularly productive legacies arising from the work. The first thing I want to tell you about is Douglas's sense that we're all engaged in a perpetual process of arranging and rearranging our environments, busily making the world conform to an idea, as she put it, centrally concerned with dealing with dirt. Douglas was focused pretty clearly on spatial and visual processes by which we busily make the world conform to an idea. In building that initial foundation, Douglas effectively opened the way for examining the unseen and less geographically or architecturally constituted bounds or coordinates within which we live our lives. And in that particular part of my paper, I want to consider how we make the world conform to an idea elementally, specifically via the air and even more specifically via the air conditioner and the consequences of so doing. The air conditioner's capacity to regulate temperature, as well as its capacity to clean the air, allows me to show how dirt arises conceptually and how tidying it up serves to maintain and reveals middle class integrity. That has enormous consequences for temperature writ large, that is in the form of climate change. After that exciting little um, section, I want to take you through how her sense of classificatory orders that, along with Weberian insights, helped the late Zygmunt Bauman to proffer a controversial reworking of the Holocaust. Bauman's reworking relies far less on hatred than it does on rationality for its explanations. That's really important because it reveals the precarity for all who stand beyond systems. The reliance of the Holocaust on rationality makes it far more, not far less, frightening than if it were based on the kind of irrational hatred that tends to flare brightly and briefly. Finally, and riffing off the fact that Bauman used a series of everyday metaphors to demonstrate his Douglas Inferred Insights, my third and final point has to do with one key metaphor used consistently throughout the COVID pandemic. The point of so doing is to draw out the relationship that Douglas proposed between personal bodies on the one hand and the world on the other, and the relevance of that relationship for understanding things like pandemics. Douglas used a great many metaphors to make these claims about the correlation between the personal body and the social world that are relevant to how we've been able to understand and respond to COVID and indeed order the world anew in its wake. So if all of that sounds all right with you, I'll launch right into the first part of what I want to tell you about, which is really what is purity and danger all about. Purity and danger is an analysis of the concepts of ritual purity and pollution in different societies at different times. In the final update that Mary Douglas made to the preface of purity and danger before her death at age 86 in 2002, she tried to say succinctly what it had all been about. She said this, and I'm quoting her here, everyone universally finds dirt offensive. It's only the way it's defined that varies. That all depends on localised classificatory systems because of and beyond which dirt exists. That is to say, dirt is matter out of place. Dirt is ambiguous and anomalous, causing anxiety by disrupting classification systems and the normal ordered relationships throughout which one understands the world. There's a few important things there, including that universally people feel kind of naturally that something is wrong and thus register dirt feelingfully and in their body. Also present is the notion that dirt is not something in itself, but is instead the result of the failure of things, persons, ideas, practices to fit into a classificatory system. That is, dirt is a kind of compendium category for all events that blur, smudge, contradict or otherwise confuse accepted classifications. The underlying feel is that a system of values that have habitually expressed in a given arrangement of things has been violated, another of her quotes. Douglas details four kinds of violations to classification systems. The first one is kind of pollution that arises around external boundaries that people manage with rules about the circumstances under which things can come into and exit from the social and physical body. So an example of this might be um, those things which are 
in the body or placed inside the body cannot come out and then re-enter. And there are plenty of myths and religious examples of that um, that are also and equally meant to express that the same goes for membership in a social group. The second one concerns transgression of, an intern of the internal lines of a system. People classify social life here into two opposing categories, what's acceptable and what is not. It is this classification system that provides societies with their moral or ethical order. <clears throat> Transgressions might occur on that internal line that separates acceptable from unacceptable, and to deal with it, people can develop secular and or religious rituals to make sure they stay both physically and morally pure. It is, for example, unacceptable to eat food that has fallen to the floor, and we generally don't consume it. But perhaps you, like sometimes me, invoke the five second rule or the 10 second rule or the slightly more seconds rule to keep you safe, to prevent pollution when you retrieve that delicious snack from the rug where the dog has been. Perhaps you, like me, wipe your bench down before food prep, but you probably don't let that product stand for the half hour that the bottle says would guarantee a germ-free surface. And don't, because those rules are not to do with simply guaranteeing hygiene. Instead, they're best understood as moral symbols, firmly based in the concepts people have developed about impurity. The third danger is the margin and permits us to hierarchise the dangers that emerge at the margins. Many, many things emerge from the body, but some things are much worse than other things. It's a hard to think really of why snot is so much worse than tears. But we all know it's not really got a place in romantic poetic renderings of heartbreak. They're always about tears, they're really about snot. Now that's important because different cultures rank marginal material emerging from the body differently and in accordance with broader social concerns. But universally, the very worst pollutants at the margins are the ones having to do with profoundly social practices of sex and eating. Those are the ones we tend to police the most. The fourth and final threat deals with internal contradiction and describes the kind of pollution that threatens really strict purity systems. Strict purity is really hard to live up to and people often fail. Accidents happen or things in the world just don't neatly fit into categories and they remain anomalous. Stuff like that though presents a terrible threat or it has the capacity to because contradictions and hypocrisy could bring about the downfall of the whole system. And so somehow you've got to deal with these. There's a number of ways of so doing. People could deal with that by nominating somebody else, like a priest or a virgin, to be pure on the behalf of everybody else. Another option is to pretend to be pure, like chaga men who, post their initiation, pretend that their anuses are permanently blocked. The basic idea is that things that don't fit have to be taken care of ideologically in case they pollute the entire classificatory system. All right, so that's a very brief understanding of what we're talking about in terms of what's at the heart of purity and danger. So with all of that under our belts, let's go on to my first example of her world-changing influence and for that to the air conditioner. So I hope that you can see from my four descriptions there of how pollution rises up to threaten classification systems, that borders and boundaries are really important to Mary Douglas. She describes work that people have to do to maintain the integrity of systems as a kind of vocabulary of spatial limits and physical and verbal science to hedge around these kind of vulnerable relations we're all in. In eliminating dirt of all kinds, Douglas argues we are involved in perpetual spatial and vis visual processes of arranging and rearranging environs, busily making the world conform to an idea. It's pretty easy to apply Douglas's ideas in those spatial and visual terms. For example, we can see that spaces we're familiar with make our classificatory systems really um, readily um, appreciable or visible. Spaces or infra infrastructures specifically identified as dirty or clean include strategies for dealing with contaminated materiality, for example, or unwanted polluting matter, like bathrooms, dumps, sewers, and symmetry. So we've got places to put dirty things and, and they're, they're spatialized. And we also know when those systems are a little bit um, troubled or problematized because we know when things have leached out their bounds and begin to threaten the spatial order, 
we might be able to see them in the interstitial zones between say commercial and public buildings like in alleyways uh, or vacant lots that are replete with peripheral things and marginal people and things like mattresses that have been ejected from the indoors you know those kinds of things um, we might see that they don't belong there and they start to threaten the integrity of the system Reclamation of marginal spaces also happens though, when polluting graffiti, for example, becomes a touristic art form. The spatialised discussion of things like prohibition, transgression, punishment, reform, provides a platform for exploring the role of the built fabric as both a reflection of and an instrument in the production of those classificatory systems. But what I wanna tell you about here is that Douglas's legacy extends well beyond the visual and the spatial. Moving beyond those parameters lets us understand things really, really differently than we could before. So let me take a slight detour here and present to you the case of anorexia, always thought of as a spectacularly visual disorder based on the key classification of dividing up fattening from non-fattening foods to produce ultimately the thin body. But if we look closely and examine the work of anorexia, we might discover that the worst foods are those capable of changing their forms from say the solid form of butter to its liquid form of an oil. Anorexic people interviewed by my colleague Megan Warren in the 1990s lost control of those slippery things that went into the body and they described them invariably as polluting and dirty. Instead of fattening and non-fattening inputs being the problem, they spoke of clean and dirty foods. The dirty ones were neither solid nor liquid or worse both and could change form between slipping out of classificatory organisation to the extent that people lost control of them. They didn't know where they went in the body, but they knew as soon as they put them in, they would melt and they would become something else, something sneaky and sly. And that kind of classification work can only be made on the basis of understanding how food feels inside the body, on the lips and inside the mouth. You certainly couldn't know it by looking at the thin body or watching someone eat those things. And the same sort of thing applies to space, which may be understood to be interstitial or marginal, not so much on how they might look as on how they might say smell. Cigarette smoke or urine, these are dead giveaway smells of the status of a space and its literal and metaphoric status as polluted. But I don't want to dwell on anorexia or smoke or we here, I want to talk about air conditioners. Consider the white modern air conditioner whose sleek design has arisen from particular and peculiar Western ideas about dirt and cleanliness to yield the very image of exaggerated hygiene. Housing the magical equipment, not only to regulate the too hot or too cold air out there into the interior of the home and also the shopping mall, but also to purify it fit for inhalation into the physical body within the optimally temperatured home. The air conditioner has also produced new understandings and perceptions of pollution. It permits us to know, as Dakin's new advertisement reminds us, that the air is in need of purifying and perfecting. It's filled with things that shouldn't be permitted inside bodies, not the least of which is dust. Not doing that, not cleaning it, it's um, inferred, interferes with other domains of the habitus, other practice, like sleep, like mental performance, like physical and emotional health, and even in the stability of the relationships of the people in your family. So if you haven't seen that day can add, it makes the claim that we draw in 10,000 litres of air and if we don't draw in clean air, we're going to be unrested, we're going to be sick in the mind, sick in the body, we won't really be able to um, be members of a family properly. And so obviously, really obviously, a grave pollution lurks here. The dust in the air wafts invisibly, entering the lungs, the mind, the soul, the family. The cleansing air conditioner, itself only one of many pieces of equipment dedicated to the safe dispensation of a threat to all those kinds of order, sits here dealing with the pollution. Assuring the purity of the air and all it protects and undergirds requires systematic boundary maintenance, as well as potentially air conditioner maintenance. One of the most obvious ways in which that has to be done is by preventing the air from revealing that it has a past. And that's really what air conditions do. Unlike water, the air takes pollution away from our present and our presence. Pollution 
uh, blows away from us in the air, dissipates invisibly, leaving the impression that the air is infinite and bears no trace of its past or our past as we've put it into the air. But those who dwell in places where pollution refuses to leave, where it hangs around as smog, um, for example, or pollution, uh, know that the air is not infinite, but is profoundly finite, present, and laden, laden down with what we've done to it and what, is, what it has experienced. The very notion of conditioning the air involves removing all evidence of what the air has picked up before it arrived for us to breathe in and all traces of its past. In some way, that is a profoundly middle-class example of hygiene reform, or at the very least, a key enactment of modern class social life. Air conditioners obviously and principally regulate the temperature of the air. Extremes of heat and cold might be understood as dangerous pollutants, not only to the personal body, but to the social order. Douglas's work permits us to track how metaphoric indices of heat and cold produce current social material and economic order itself. Central to that undertaking is the insidious power of temperature that operates most prominently in the range of neutrality, a range in which neither heat nor cold disrupts the protectorate of the moderate. In common with the middle class preference for scent free atmospheres, temperature hides its power behind an apparent neutrality that masks its inextricable intertwinement with the production of late capitalist, capitalist coordinates. The power of this neutrality is itself recognised in the root word itself, temperaturus, past participle of temporary, to mix in due proportion, modify, blend and restrain oneself as of temper. That's a quality called upon consistently to tame the worst excesses of the left and the right. But the relevance of hot metaphoric language temperatures, boiling rage, overheated debates, cold responses, as a pollut pollution to things like the national temper or the rights of movements to come out of control is not simply restricted to just the idea of neutrality and the production of a rational mean condition. It's all too real. That is, it is indisputably the case that heat and its regulation is never benign. Seasonal temperature highs that are too hot to handle everywhere, but which create urban heat islands 10 degrees hotter than their green surrounds, impact bodies, genders, economies, societies, infrastructural networks, and built and natural environments brutally unevenly. Alex Nading has recently named those processes as the thermal politics of life and death, or as thermal necropolitics. We can already identify who is necro available to the heat in the unbearable overlap of climate change and COVID, the plants, animals and humans who live within the most vulnerable of those combined coordinates. Those realities are never undone from cool-headed political decisions about whether or not to get out of coal or what will win elections or any of the concerns of the neutral middle class. It's here that Douglas work permits us to see the intemperateness of real and metaphoric origins as deadly pollutants to the system. The intemperate activity that makes people necro-available is certainly no new classification for us to think with. And in one of its previous manifestations, indicates people constitute pollution that require solution. Here I offer my second example of the world-changing impact of purity and danger. Zig Bauman developed a theme originally explored by Mary Douglas and John Paul Sartre that contrasted the liberating fluidity of today with the cloying stickiness of the past to proffer new insights into the occurrence of the Holocaust. Unlike the vast majority of commentators, Bauman did not view hateful anti-Semitism as the cause of the Holocaust. He instead privileges the notion that Nazis, along with others who helped round people up in their respective jurisdictions, were simply following orders to the extent that rational self-preservation and bureaucracy supported Nazi mass murder much more than hatred ever could. Bauman said it like this, and I'm quoting him, when God wanted to destroy someone, he did not make him mad, he made him rational. Bauman's reassessment of the Holocaust relies on Weber's exposition of modern bureaucracy and rationality, where just about every scholarly authority stresses the irrationality of the Nazis. Bauman suggests that at no point of its long and torturous execution did the Holocaust come in conflict with any principle of rationality. So what was the rational concern? Bauman suggests that the Holocaust was part of the solid modern era. 
It was the concrete, sticking, cloying, inescapable and defining notions of modernity, blood and soil, nation, state and territory that made the Holocaust possible and he reckoned inevitable. This solid world manifest in its sticky isms, communism, socialism, fascism, sought to stick people to fixed, well-determined ideologies. Solid systems like that are vulnerable to their inherent logical contradictions. The imposition of any and all ordering designs necessarily requires the identification of that which is disordered and threatens the design itself, requiring the elimination of whatever that is. Whatever is beyond the system represents the temporary failure of the system itself until that threat is eliminated. As Douglas puts it, the real affront that Jewishness presented was to solidity. And the response solidity made was the rational elimination of that which threatened its integrity. That's why Bauman describes the Holocaust as a rational response to pollution rather than the irrational hatred of people per se, and why he described it as inevitable. Solidities must always confront and destroy their threats. But things get worse, not better, in liquid modernity, where beyondness is presumed to be endemic, irreparable and inevitable. Beyondness then does not constitute the threat of failure. Again, drawing on Douglas, Bauman described those who stand beyond in metaphoric terms. Yesterday, in the era of solid modernity, the Jews were the paradigmatic weeds. Today, in liquid times, single mothers, college dropouts, drug takers, asylum seekers are all accused of being weed-like. These metaphors are really important because they tell us so much about the conditions of power and unbelonging and alienness that come to vest themselves in real suffering bodies at the margins. They were critically important in Douglas's work too that so inspired Bauman. Purity and danger relies upon observations she made in her 16 months of fieldwork with the Lele people as part of her very first ethnographic endeavour and then as well on observations she made of those lives in the West, including her own. In fact, Douglas reminded people that when she wrote Purity and Danger, she was stuck at home with the mumps with two whingy kids. In that situation, she could not help but notice the worth of domestic metaphors that linked the personal body with the social and natural world. It was that use of metaphor that revealed just how similar modern scientific rational explanations of health and hygiene were to non-Western so-called primitive ideas about magic and superstition. All of them were founded in ideas about the integrity of bodies and worlds, and all of them were concerned with guarding against that which arose at the margins to threaten and pollute them via ritual corrective. The power of metaphors to reveal universal patterns like that is part of Douglas's profoundly domestic, mumpy, whingy, kid-laden circumstance, as she wrote Purity and Danger, something that makes me think about the conditions under which particularly women labour today as they write their own masterpieces while homeschooling and tending to all manner of pollutions that emit seemingly endlessly from young children's bodies. Her use of ordinary metaphors, born of the domestic circumstances, set out the attendance one must simultaneously make to body and world if one is to understand anything at all, including COVID. Her use of them was initially unfavourably regarded, as I said, because this was no grand theory and it was savaged as such. Like so much of the yield of purity and danger, its value was to come to pass much later, as my third and final example will demonstrate. In his 1983 paper, Thinking Through the Body, Michael Jackson drew upon poetic and philosophical material that concerned the correspondences between humans and nature, including the philosophical insight made by the Roman statesman Seneca, who'd observed in the first century AD that watercourses were as veins of the body and earthquakes were like its convulsions. This correlation of body with world pervades all human societies. In his own work among the Karenko of Sierra Leone, Jackson observes that metaphor is not simply a reflection of landscape, but a much more complex process in which there is dialectical unity. Metaphors, in his view, presuppose continuity between language, knowledge and bodily practice, and so mediate relationships between conceptual and physical domains of the habitus. The discovery of connections between the world and our own bodies is not a process that occurs at the level of self-conscious attention, though. Indeed, as Jackson points out, imagining, at the imagining a mouth at the very same time as you use the turn of phrase, the mouth of the river, would be downright odd. Now, that oddness is at the heart of Jackson's argument that metaphors do not serve to say something in the terms of some other thing or to make a rhetorical synthesis of two otherwise unrelated terms. 
metaphor in his in his view reveals not the thisness of that rather this is that here metaphors refer simultaneously to the self and the world by means of reciprocal anthropomorphism metaphors express dialectical movement between the personal body and the world because they refer to the body on the one hand and to the social and natural environments on the other and they synthesize and mediate those two things it was in that way that Jackson worked out that Karanko people understand, understand that when they walk along paths in their, um, between their cooking yards, their sleeping quarters and their other spaces, grasses move one way and when they walk back, grasses move another way and that was as though breath in the body. It was how I was able to understand that my work, uh, when I was working on Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean, what Christmas Islanders meant when they described red crabs as the island's blood even down to the fact that they moved along arterial pathways that the islanders from time to time had to unblock and how they knew that invasive yellow ants were as a cancer on that blood that the csiro, CSIRO was treating via chemotherapeutic means breath and blood in the bodies of karenko villages and christmas islanders were in other words not abstract people in their places each lived and breathed became ill ministered to injury and healed together that takes Douglas's founding notion a bit further, but it was her work that made me intuitively realise that Australian residents of Christmas Island described yellow crazy ants and asylum seekers, both of whom had arrived by boat without permission, were killing the crabs and were killing the people. Each brought disease, cancer, death. Body and world were as one. Jackson has argued that any disruption of normal natural and or social patterns like crab blood dying from ant attack, people dying from foreign diseases brought in by foreign bodies, and extremely disruptive events like COVID are often the catalyst that causes connections between personal, social and natural bodies to be fully realised. Waves emerged as the key intuitive connector between personal, social and natural bodies during COVID. Peaks of illness burden were described in the terms of first, second, third and fourth waves dreaded, fearsome, huge, and initially unstoppable by human hand, they engulfed health systems, indiscriminately washed over whomever was in their way. They took the breath from those they overwhelmed. We could hold back a little later on the tide with vaccines and we could persist, resist in protective neighborhood bubbles filled with air. Such ready metaphors, public waves serve to render the invisible, indeed wholly insensible virus appreciable to us. They let us make the alien dimensions of COVID intelligible. One of the problems with, with it is that it was too small to see. The work of the metaphor then must at first be concerned with accomplishing an equilibrium of personal and world scale. It had to render the virus something in our own world so that the natural and personal worlds could correspond. We sometimes do the opposite of that with miniature villages pulling the hugeness of that which we cannot see from any advantage in the actual city into a scale of correspondence with human sensibility. Metaphors have profound effects, especially when they scale world and personal bodies inappropriately. In June 2020, the World Health Organization issued some very critical remarks about the use of wave metaphors, asking for politicians to please stop talking in particular of successions of waves, precisely because they play down too much the role of humans in controlling the spread of a virus, rendering the virus much bigger than us and able to produce seemingly innumerable waves. That, of course, did not stop Boris Johnson from saying in March 2021, and I'm quoting him here, on the continent right now, you can see, sadly, there is a third wave underway. And people in this country should be under no illusions that the previous experience has taught us that when a wave hits our friends, I'm afraid it washes up on our shores as well. In making those remarks, Johnson exploited the uncontrollability of literal waves to blame what was happening in other countries for a resurgence of the pandemic in the UK. Another reason for why the World Health Organization did not want to see its continued use, preferring the activities on a human scale to describe what was happening. Understanding the interconnection that metaphor reveals between person and world is crucial then, rather than simply poetically speculative. That's part of Douglas's legacy by which we know that shared symbols create a unity in experience and that purity and pollution symbols denote beliefs about social order. 
we cannot afford to ignore attitudes towards pollution and purity, given that their effects concern class, gender, climate change, COVID, and the other, those weeds who lie beyond and suffer the passions of living beyond classification. Now, one more thing. I said at the beginning that Douglas was indirectly responsible for my teaching reputation. And that's because each and every year when I teach my first year anthropology students in semester one, I cut my own hair into some ice cream. Students recoil in repulsion. But there is nothing dirty about my hair and nothing dirty either about the ice cream. But they do belong in different taxonomic registers, different domains. The dirt arises, of course, in accordance with Mary Douglas, as a result of the coincidence of the hair and the ice cream. None of the students agrees to eat the proffered ice cream. They all protect the bounds of the body, refusing admittance to such a repulsive thing. And we're in Douglas territory now, and it's only 10 minutes into the first lecture. It is the best way I know to show the students the difference between common knowledge, that yuck reaction, and the uncommon knowledge so characteristic of anthropological explorations of the world, what organises that reaction we all know to be the right one to yell out, yuck. What else does classification, taxonomification render polity? It isn't long before we are talking about Australian racism, the design of the lecture theatre of knowledge itself. What a legacy and what a way to change the world.